So today, I want to just hit some of the high points and really major historical events and how that related to where the church was. I'm not going to do justice to the church in modern times because, as I said earlier in this course, the closer you get to today, the more complicated, the more details, the more difficult it is to try to encapsulate it. So I'm just going to hit a couple of high points as we go along. And the first one I want to hit is the Catholic Church, Catholicism in modern times, and particularly the papacy and the French Revolution. The French Revolution, of course, was the um, between 1787 and 1799, after the American Revolution. A lot of people don't get that. The French Revolution was later. The French Revolution was an effort by the French people to take rationalism. Remember, we talked about rationalism as being growing and more important, you know, since the Enlightenment on. Enlightenment started in the 1600s. They took it to an extreme so that there actually was a cult of reason, it was called. And because of this cult of reason and this belief in human um, human potential, that whole modernist kind of idea, which was, which again, started with the Enlightenment, the idea was there that the French thought, we're going to get rid of anything that limits us from, from achieving our extraordinary potential as rational beings. Well, that included getting rid of the monarchy. This is why the French Revolution is known for seigneur guillotine, because the way they got rid of the political control was to execute a whole bunch of them and execute people who, no, people who didn't like it, who complained about it. Well, this also involved them trying to get rid of any religious controls. In fact, trying to get rid of any religion. The, uh, the French Revolution was clearly atheistic in its orientation because they elevated humanity and human reason. So, the 18th century French, that is the 1700s, working up to the 1787 start of the French Revolution, they moved uh, toward ever-increasing liberalism in terms of not wanting to have religion, not wanting to have civil authority, they wanted complete freedom, and rationalism. You know, they thought they were all smart enough they could run their own lives, they didn't need princes and dukes and kings or popes and priests and bishops to tell them what to do. That led to the French Revolution, and all along the way, it was strongly opposed, leading up to and during the French Revolution, by the Catholic Church, and most specifically by Pope Pius VI, who was the Pope during the, the, the before, immediately before and during the French Revolution. The 1775 to 1799 was when Pius was the Pope. For some reason, Pope's name Pius seemed to serve for a long time, as we'll see. You know, a couple of the longest uh, tenures of Popes have been Pius's. In 1798, at the you know, French Revolution, late the French Revolution, the French army, this is the army of the Republic of the French Revolution, took Rome. They marched into Italy, they took Rome, they declared Rome a Republic, and they said that the Pope was no longer the temporal ruler of the city. Because technically, the Pope ruled all of Rome and all of the Papal States. You will remember back to Charlemagne, 800s? Charlemagne's father was called Pepin the Short. <laughs> Pepin the Short had developed a close relationship with the papacy, and he had marched in and conquered the, um, the folks that were, the, the pagan tribes that were threatening Rome and all of that kind of stuff. And he, in the process, because he conquered Italy, he gave large tracts of land, sort of a big diagonal sweep all the way across the nation of Italy, the peninsula of Italy. And he, he awarded that to the Pope and said, you have, you, you're the ruler of this land now. Those were called the people states. And so for, from 800, before 800 until 1800, for over a thousand years, the Pope had actually been a secular ruler over his own lands, the city of Rome and the, the, papal, the papal states, which were significant. Um, I mean, it would have been the, easily the size of, one of, the, of a fairly good sized state in the United States. It was a large area. So anyway, the French army march into Rome, they declare a republic, they say the Pope is no longer temporal ruler of the city or of the states. Now they don't technically do anything beyond that, they declare that. Pius VI becomes a, rather a prisoner of them, uh, sort of stuck in Rome, and he dies a year later. The cardinals of the Catholic Church have fled to Austria. Francis II of Austria was an enemy an opponent of the French Revolution. 
So they went to Austria because in Austria they could, you know, they could elect a new, a new pope without the French Republic, the army of the French Republic doing anything about it. Um, and so they elect a successor in 1801. This is three years later. Napoleon has taken power. The French Revolution ended basically when Napoleon rose up. So Napoleon has taken power. Napoleon's a smart guy. He had enough enemies. And he decided he didn't need for the church to be an enemy as well, even though he was not religious. Okay, he advocated pretty much atheism himself, but he didn't see making the church an enemy. And so he kind of settled things down, and he reinstated Pius VII, who had been the newly elected pope three years earlier, uh, reinstated Pius VII in Rome. And then in 1804, in appreciation for that, Pius VII traveled to Paris, for the crowning of Napoleon as Emperor of Europe. Interesting little scenario there. Um, Pius, and again, this is one of the things the popes had done for, you know, since the time of Charlemagne. You remember that, that uh, the Pope, uh, Leo, I think it was, but it all runs together. Uh, the Pope had put the crown on Charlemagne's head and made him the first Holy Roman Emperor. Since that time, the Holy Rome, the emperors of Europe had been crowned by the Pope. And they considered that a symbol of the fact that, yeah, you may be emperor, but I am really in charge because I have God on my side, and I'm the one who said it was okay for you to be emperor. So this was a power thing. When Pius VII goes to Paris for the crowning of Napoleon as emperor, Pius comes forward with the crown, and Napoleon reaches out and takes it out of his hands and puts it on his own head. As a very clear sign that, okay, it's fine that you're here, but you're not making me emperor. I'm the making me emperor. Okay? So there was a little strain there. And then, seven years later, 1808, the Napoleonic French army invade Rome. They again make the Pope a virtual prisoner, and that continued until Napoleon fell out of power. After his release and reinstating, Pius VII and several generations of his successors repeatedly after this, because of this really bad experience with Republican or Democratic, I mean the, the French Revolution was not Democratic in terms of voting, but Republican, and I don't mean the, the political parties, American Republican, American Democratic, Rep a republic is a place where that is run by elected representatives. Okay, Democratic means everybody gets to vote on stuff. So what we mean here is anything that is not centrally controlled by a monarchy or by a pope or bishops or whatever, because of the very bad experience they had had under uh, the, the French Revolution and the Republic of the French Revolution, that basically was an oligarchy where a few guys behind the scenes who were deciding whose head to cut off, but the Republic of the French was such a bad experience for the popes, they decided that they didn't want to have anything to do with that. In fact, it was against the will of God. And they advocated very strongly against democracy and against republics, that is, elected officials running governments, that it should be controlled by monarchs and the Pope. And they continued in that, so much so that later on, um, Pope Leo XIII, after, and I'm going to get to this in a minute, after the Italian government, the new nation of Italy, the kingdom of Italy, after they took the papal uh, uh, states away from the Pope, the Pope... Uh, told Catholics in Italy they were not allowed to vote in Italian elections. Well, that continued for a hundred years. Good Catholics were not voting in elections. What did that mean? The people being elected to office were not the ones that the Pope wanted. Shoot yourself in the foot much. This is, this is like when Charles I, you know, was having trouble with, well, was, with, with uh, Parliament, and he was awarding the, the, the House of Commons <coughs> He was awarding the ones in the commons that liked him and did what he wanted, he was making them lords. Well, by making them lords, they were no longer part of the House of Commons and they couldn't vote for his stuff anymore. Okay? The law of unintended consequences, or duh, as we sometimes say. Yes? <laughs> why, after seven years of being crowned, uh, Napoleon was crowned, why did the, uh, the French army invade Italy? Well, because the, the Pope, you know, the, the, the <clears throat> idea that the Pope wanted to crown Napoleon was a sign of the fact the Pope really thought he was more important. The fact Napoleon took the crown out of his hands and crowned himself meant Napoleon was saying very clearly, I'm more important. Pope, uh, the, Napoleon had wanted to kind of have peace, but he kept having trouble. The popes, again, this is after the, the, uh, the revolution. Uh, 
The popes kept advocating for more power and more power. And I, you may be the emperor, but you need to do what I say. And Napoleon goes, Napoleon, okay, I don't do what you say. And eventually, Napoleon had enough of it, and he, he sent his army in, and they took over uh, Rome. Okay, so it was a power play, simple as that. I mean, it wasn't they didn't kill the pope, or you know, and it, they just said, okay, you can't go out anymore. You got to stay home. Uh, you're grounded. All right, now, following this, after the several generations, we come to a period in which there was a, a change in Catholic temporal power, which the popes responded to by, by trying to increase their religious power. Let me explain what that means. Pope Pius IX, oh, that's the wrong number. It should be uh, to just to 78, 46 to 78, 32 years. He was pope for 32 years, the longest papacy ever. And um, during that time, the popes lost virtually any, all temporal power they'd ever had. In other words, when we say temporal, the ability to have political influence, um, unquestioned political influence. Prior to this, the pope had, had pretty direct influence in a lot of different ways throughout Europe, but the one area he was absolutely ruler over, absolute sovereign in, was Rome and the papal states. They lose that during Pius IX. Um, now, uh, Pius IX, because of some of the struggles and difficulties that had happened in his predecessors, the French Revolution and the time, Napoleon the time following, uh, the, Pius IX tried to reinstate himself as an absolute monarch, meaning absolute control, nobody can question it, not the emperor, not anybody else. He pushed very hard for that. Despite the fact that in 1848, just two years after he became pope, there was a revolution um, in in Rome, in Italy, in fact, in Rome, and they declared that the city of Rome was now a republic. Remember, the popes don't like republic, and yet they been declared a republic. That just caused Pius IX to try harder to make everybody do what he said, and he would stone his little people's feet and tell people they had to do things, and people stopped listening to him. Clearly, the temporal power of the pope was beginning to decline. As a response to that loss of temporal power, which happened over a period of time, and then there was a big cut, um, Pius tried to take efforts, in fact sweeping efforts, to increase his religious power. And some of the doctrines that you probably are most aware of, and as a Protestant have the most trouble with, happen in this time. For instance, in 1854, Pius declares the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Do you know what that is? Yes. It means Mary, not Jesus. Mary was born without sin. Now, Catholic theologians have argued about this point for a long, long time. Well, how could Mary have Jesus and him be without sin if Mary had sin? And so maybe, what happened there? Okay. Um, the, the interesting thing about this, which reflects the fact that Pius IX was trying to gain absolute control again, is that Pius did not call, this is a major dogma, this is a major doctrine, this is a huge thing. Okay. Um, it may not seem like it does, but it was to them. It was kind of a test case for Pius, because he did not call a council of the church to make a decision about this important doctrinal point. He declared it himself on his own, and then sort of waited to see how people were going to respond to this. He got a little pushback, but not a lot. They accepted it. Okay, he went, okay, so far so good. Then, Ten years later, and there's a lot of stuff happening in here, but ten years later, um, he issues what's called the Syllabus of Errors, in which he has this expansive list of all the ways in which the secular states and Protestants and, you know, pretty much everybody but him are wrong about stuff. And it includes things like he denies um, separation of church and state, the church rule, all political he denies freedom of worship and religion. Nobody else should be allowed to be anything but Catholic. You do it the way we tell you to do it. Um, and and you, can't, you can't start a new Catholic church without my permission. Okay. He denied the freedom of the press. He denied democratic process. He denied public schools, that the state does not have a right to educate children without the church, the church should be doing it. He denied the right of the civil authorities to apply their laws to the church. You remember in the last... 20 or so years, the, the, the crisis in the Catholic Church over uh, sexual abuse, 
one of the things people had the most heartburn about in that whole thing was the fact that when bishops, or cardinals in some cases, would find out about a priest doing wrong things, they didn't report them to the civil authorities. They would transfer them or tell them you have to go into, in, into privately into counseling or whatever, and some of them ended up doing it again. That idea that we don't call the police when, we, when somebody is abusing children, if they're a priest, but we deal with it ourselves, there are people who still maintain that idea, even though they've, they've been forced, legally, they've been forced to change that now, but they still maintain the theological idea that the Catholic Church is not subject to the civil laws of the nation. That goes back to Pius, and it was a control issue. Okay? And a bunch of others. A lot of other stuff. Virtually everything we consider as being inherent freedoms of a free nation today, Pius said no to. No free speech. No right of voting, no uh, freedom of religion, no freedom of the press, no private schools that aren't run by the church or public schools that aren't run by the church, etc., etc., etc. Okay? And we wonder why they've had problems. And then, the big one. In 1868 to 1870, he calls the First Vatican Council. And the Vatican Council says a lot of things, but the most important thing they say is that the Pope, as the the rep, as the representative of Christ, the heir to St. Peter, is infallible. Now, you need to understand. They did not say, nor do they say today, that the Pope is always infallible. You know? His, his favorite football team does not always win. Okay? There are a lot of things that the Pope is not infallible about. In fact, the only thing they said, which most Protestants don't get, is that the Pope without the consent of anybody, even the rest of the church, was infallible when he speaks ex cathedra. Ex cathedra means from the chair. A cathedral was the chair of the bishop. That's why a cathedral. Cathedra is the chair. So ex cathedra means when the Pope says, I am speaking with the authority of St. Peter as his heir and representative of Christ on earth, when he speaks ex cathedra, he's said to be infallible as of the First Vatican Council. That has only happened once. People are shocked by that. Okay. Um, my question uh, in regards to the Pope. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Uh, is that uh, when we were talking about apostolic succession and that, uh, we have now read all the popes that, you know, uh, name themselves popes and uh, you know all the mess that the church was in. How I once had a good Catholic tell me no pope has ever taught anything that wasn't correct. There was there. I believe that. I believe that. Um, how could they possibly be saying uh, talking about the secession okay. coming from the secession. Saint Peter, Saint Peter's succession? Well. Uh, I don't really have a problem with that. I mean, I, to me, they, they may be successors of St. Peter, but the fault in that, I, that thinking is that just because there's a line from, you know, that every, you know, every minister that has been ordained by the laying on of hands by someone who had the hand, you know, all the way back to the See, apostles, yes. and it's not just to Peter, it's to the apostles. Yeah. I think that that's very possible, that apostolic succession may be real, and people who were ordained today may be having been ordained by someone who was ordained by someone who was ordained by somebody who was ordained by an apostle. The mistake in that thinking is the idea that that's going to make them better. <laughs> okay? The original idea back in the early days of the church was, because the reliance on the apostolic teaching and authority, is that if somebody has been ordained by somebody who was ordained by somebody who was ordained by an apostle, it's more likely that the teaching they received is going to be accurate and correct. Well, 2,000 years is a long time for people to wander off of the right path, whether, no matter who they were ordained by. And so that's the error, I think, is in thinking that succession makes a difference in terms of theological or doctrinal accuracy. Now, let me answer this question, and then we'll continue. Uh, the only time the Pope has spoken ex cathedra, meaning he was infallible and cannot be questioned, was in 1950 when he declared the bodily assumption of Mary. In 1950, the Pope said that when Mary died, or finished her earthly mission, she was bodily taken into heaven. 
She didn't get buried and is in the ground somewhere before. Now, I don't know enough about it to know why that was the one big deal. Since, since the First Vatican Council, why only one time in 1950 they felt the need to declare it ex cathedra. But nothing else the popes have said have they claimed infallibility about, but they've always got that card in their pocket. Okay. We were told last week that the Catholic Church is still teaching that there's a room in the Vatican that when the Pope goes in there, whatever information he receives, direct new revelation from God and comes out and tells the people that. A certain room, huh? <laughs> Are there porcelain fixtures in that room? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I, I don't know that. I, don't know. I mean, there is, a, there, there is a sense in which the Pope is the Vicar of Christ, which means he is... He is the one through whom direction for the church comes and doctrinal direction. Like that. It's in that room. Yeah, I heard. That's what they're being told this now. Yeah. We're looking for the key to the room. Yeah. yeah. John, you have a question? In regards to what Roberta was saying, I think her point was not questioning this, the Pope succession, but there's a point when you have three guys that say they're popes. Yeah. So obviously there's a breakdown in the succession. And I think yeah. that's what she was pointing Well, out. And, and that's why and the reliability the, of it. That's why the Great Schism was a problem because that was the, there had been anti popes before that's what they're called anti popes <clears throat> somebody who's not who claims to be pope but doesn't have a right to the great schism was problematic because the same cardinals that elected urban got mad or scared or whatever it was and they left and they elected another pope so for the very first time now they all of them were already bishops and cardinals i mean a cardinal is just a bishop with a special hat so, it's true, you know, bishop is the highest position in the church, the pope is a bishop. So, but the idea was that the, the, all of the bishops, before they became popes, they already were supposed to be direct line of succession from the apostles, okay? Um, but, the, when you, the problem with the, the schism, the great schism, is here you had two popes, both of whom were elected by valid cardinals, in fact, elected by the same cardinals. And then, <coughs> The, the urban then appointed his own cardinals from other bishops, which he has the power to do as a pope, and that started the whole mess. But um, all of them were, all of those popes during the Great Schism were all elected by cardinals who were valid bishops, who were, you know, um, the product of apostolic succession according to the Catholic Church. It gets very complicated. Again, my, my sense is that the, there was originally a good reason for apostolic succession in like the second, third centuries, but after the death of the last apostle, but since that time, it makes much more sense to say, okay, are, do you agree with, are you in agreement with, and do you teach and believe the apostolic teaching of scripture more so than who laid their hands on you? Yes, exactly. It just, that breaks down. Okay? Okay, <laughs> we get into a lot of stuff here. So, papal infallibility. The idea that when he speaks ex cathedral, which he has only done once, remember that. I mean, some people, I know people who think the, the Pope is supposed to be infallible in everything he says. That's not true. That's not the doctrine. But he always has the ability to say, when he really feels he has to, I am saying that it's ex cathedra, and that's all he has to say, and no one has the power in the Catholic Church to tell him he's wrong. Okay? Then, following this, you'll see these dates, 54, 64, 68 to 70 was when the council met, and then on September 20th, 1870, the Pope had known that his power was sliding terms of temporal power, so he's trying to bolster his religious power with these new doctrines. <clears throat> in September 20th, 1870, the troops of the new kingdom of Italy took the papal estates over, despite the Pope's protests, and they put an end, at that point, to all temporal power of the Pope. In fact, at that point, the Pope wasn't ruler of anything. There wasn't a Vatican yet. They did allow the Pope to keep several palaces. In fact, that's this one. The Pope's sovereignty was limited to a few palaces that Italy allowed him to keep. It was much later, 59 years later, to be exact, in 1929, that Italy acknowledged that the Vatican, Vatican City, as we call it, was not just a city or a location, but rather was a sovereign state. It was at that point that it became its own nation with the temporal ruler of that sovereign state, the Vatican City, being the Pope. And at that point, 59 years later, the, it, the nation of Italy actually compensated the Catholic Church for having taken all that stuff away from them. Probably not dollar for dollar, but they gave them some. Okay? Questions about any of that? Yes. Yes. Uh, this isn't on the test, so. <laughs> um, okay, this is the assumption of Mary. 
uh, what her prompted him to do that? I don't know. I, it, and I, I'm sh I can tell you what I'm pretty sure it would have had something to do with it, and that is um, Mariology. The, Mariology. the idea that the, what I usually call the undue reverence to the Virgin Mary. See, I think, I've said before, if you've been in the classes where I've said it, I think we Protestants fail in not giving Mary enough credit. There's a reason why she was chosen to be the mother of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so I think that when we just sort of poo-poo the whole you know, idea of Mary, I think we're doing an injustice to Mary, you know, to what God chose to do there. On the other hand, the Catholic Church has elevated Mary for various reasons, and some of them are, are very practical reasons, particularly when you go back to the early Middle Ages and the development of the monastic orders. The, the nuns, the women who joined monastic orders um, would literally marry Jesus. I mean, yes. they, they literally go through a wedding ceremony where they become the bride of Christ. It was very hard for men to be able to get into that same thing. They didn't, you know, I'm marrying Jesus? He was a guy. You know, how's that work? They needed a symbol which men could relate to in the same way that the women who were joining monastic orders could relate to Jesus. And that was one of the reasons for the elevation of the sense of who Mary was. And that developed doctrinally a whole Mariology um, over a long period of time. That's why the Immaculate Conception, and then I believe that's probably why the bodily assumption. But I do not have a lot more information than that. Okay? And it's still, the Mariology is still a very significant thing. There was, a, there was a pretty strong sense or belief that before John Paul II died, because he was a very strong Mariologist, that he was going to declare Mary co-redemptrix with Christ. Had he done so, holy moly, the world would have blown up. Okay. Florette? Then how do they, they explain that Mary had other children? They say that she didn't. Yeah. I know they say that here, but in the Bible, there was... Well, they say the word means cousin, not brothers. You not yeah. you know That Jesus had cousins, not brothers and sisters. So they Jesus, maintain her as, as Mary ever virgin. We were told so James that. the just? Well, that we believe cousin. that he's described it, yeah, exactly. They would say he was a cousin, that he wasn't a brother. That's they're taking a doctrine that they believe that God inspired the magisterium, the authority of the church, because they believe, remember, the tradition of the church is equal to the tradition of scripture. They believe God has given that revelation that Mary remained ever virgin. And again, that's an elevating of her. If she never had sex, then she must be purer than a woman who did have sex. And so they took that as a doctrine, and then they went back into Scripture and figured out what do we have to say in order to make that look like it works. I'm sorry, I can't see any other way of understanding that. We were told also last week, this was up in Manzanilla, that the church is teaching the people that the, that reference to brothers and sisters is because Joseph was a widow. And he had half-brothers. And so when he married Mary, they did not have more children. Yeah. He was a widow twice removed. I mean, again, we can come up with all kinds of supposed explanations, but it has to do with interpretation of one word, and, and only the most most traditional of Catholic scholars read that and say that doesn't mean brothers and sisters. You, any you know anything other than the most traditional, even Catholic scholars say it's, it does say brothers. You know, that's wrong. Uh, in our neighborhood, there's a very nice depiction of the Virgin Mary and John kissing her. Well, they do that to folks and bishops and everything else. In fact, Carolyn and I had dinner with some Anglicans last night. They were talking about a friend of theirs who was a bishop and who got enthroned as a bishop. It's not a word we would think of. Not installed, but enthroned. Okay, let's keep going here. I want to talk about modernity and the Christian message. Again, the modern age, or modernity, began with the Enlightenment, which was 1650 to 1800. You know, it was a long period of time. It was the rise of rationalism, uh, the age of reason, it's sometimes called. So from the Enlightenment on to, depending upon where you count it, some people say the Enlightenment may have ended at the Great Depression, because it was depressing. <laughs> people weren't so optimistic anymore, which was the characteristic of modernity. Or some people say that it ended with the nuclear threat. Some people say it ended with 
the, the, in the 80s with the explosion of communication media via the electronic digital stuff because that opened up the world in such a way. But either way, modernity, as it was called, started with the Enlightenment, was characterized by optimism and a belief in the potential for human perfection, not through faith, not through religion, but through science and reason. Now, initially, that didn't start out as being automatically anti-religious, but it developed that over a period of time, because the whole focal point was, you know, oh, the things I know. You know, the potential that I have, the potential we have, we can do anything. You know, we can, it's sort of like the Tower of Babel. Okay? We can go to the stars. We're going to live forever. There's going to be no disease. There's going to be no war. Everybody's going to get along. My clothes are always going to fit. The world is going to be perfect. Where's my jetpack? Where's my jetpack? Exactly. Um, that was modernity, okay? This optimism. Now, there was some positive aspects with regard to the church or Christianity in that. One of the things was that that level of optimism led to the modern missionary movement. The idea is, now that there was some, some racism in this. We white people have been so blessed, we have so much potential, things are so good, we need to go share this with the little people in the back. We <laughs> have a friend who always flies first class and he says, and I'm always thinking, I wonder what the little people in the back are doing. <laughs> well, that was kind of the way a lot of the early missionaries felt is those poor savages, we need to try to help them too, because things are so good for us. But either way, now it's not to say that all those missionaries were, you know, thought that way. Many of them sacrificed everything, including their lives, for the missionary efforts. But that kind of optimism of the potential of what can be done if we apply ourselves to it, combined with a very serious and sincere Christian faith, led to the modern missionary movement. We can take this message out and, and share it with the whole world. And that missionary movement has continued until today. I mean, uh, some of the modern, modern organizations, their goal is that everybody hear the word of Christ. In fact, uh, Bill Bright, uh, one, of his, uh, one of his stated goals, he died a number of years ago, many, many years ago, he said that everyone in the world would hear the gospel of Christ by the year 2000. Well, they didn't hit that goal, but trust me, they did a whole lot more than they would have otherwise if they hadn't set that goal. Okay, so you get that idea. Now, this missionary uh, zeal and this optimism of the missionary movement led, in the, 19, in the 1700s especially, to the formation of a lot of international missionary organizations, many of which still exist today. Right? And so the benefit has happened from the 1600s, especially the 1700s, and even to today, in terms of some of the major uh, worldwide mission agencies and organizations having been around for 300 years. Okay. Now, this same modernity also resulted in the international ecumenical movement in the 19th century. And the ecumenical movement really grew out of the missionary movement to a great extent. Ecumenical means pertaining to the entire inhabited earth. That's what that word means. Right? It's like Catholic means universal. It's similar. Ecumenical means everybody. And it particularly related to the fact that more and more Christians, after having come out of a history of the Christian church, where if you didn't agree with me, you know, uh, my old friend Bruce Bow, who's very funny, he used to say, they're not like us, let's kill them. <laughs> that had been very much the, the attitude of so many of the Christians down through the ages, especially if they were Anabaptists, let's go. <laughs> and so the idea was, we don't want to go there anymore. If we all believe in the same Christ, even though we make some dunk and some sprinkle, you know, etc., some have bishops and some have elders, let's work together if we have the same basic belief. And so this was the ecumenical direction, the belief that all Christians share more in common than they have in differences, and that Christians and Christian churches can work together for the good of the kingdom, and especially for the missionary efforts. Again, the ecumenical movement came to a great extent out of this missionary uh, movement. Um, and, and let me say, initially, there, there were not, other than, than like denominational differences, there weren't major theological differences in the ecumenical movement early on. Nowadays, to many evangelicals, you say ecumenical and they, you know, <laughs> because the ecumenical movement, in a sense, the extent to which it means being all-inclusive, 
in, not in all, but in some areas that has meant that people have watered down what we consider the absolute basics of the doctrine. To the point of saying, to be ecumenical, it's okay if you worship the God of the mountains as long as you believe it with your whole heart. Okay, well that's not Christian. And so that's not part of the Christian ecumenical movement. And it is true that some of the ecumenical movement has gone in that direction where anything you believe as long as you believe it sincerely, then let's get together and, you know, sing kumbaya. <laughs> um, but that's not what, where it started, and there's still a significant part of the ecumenical movement that is not there, that is still conservative in their theological basis as Christians, but believe, you know, let's focus on our similarities and work together as much as we can, right? That's why in our church we pray for every other church in town as often as I can. Baptist, Pentecostal, Catholic, uh, Anglican, you know, non-denominational, whatever it is, because they all are seeking to honor Christ. And so good on them. You know, we want to be together in that, even though we may have some doctrinal differences. Okay. Now, again, consistent with the, the optimism of modernity, it led to the first, very important, first World Missionary Council in 1910 in Edinburgh. Now, there were missionary societies, and they tended to work together in ecumenical movement, but in the 20th century, we actually had that congealing into global mission conferences and mission efforts. There have been many world mission conferences since then. Um, it's appropriate the first one was in Scotland because Scotland has been the source of so many great preachers. My mentor in preaching was Scottish, Ian Bill Watson. So um, that in turn re uh, led to, and again, a lot of people have a bad taste in their mouth about this, but it, it, it didn't start out in a way that we have problems with. That led in 1948 to the founding of the World Council of Churches. It's simply a truth that whenever you are trying to have one central um, body or organization or whatever that includes many, a very diverse multiplicity of things, there's always a danger that somebody's going to feel like you're watering down the wrong thing. You can't, you know, you have to be softer on some things or you can't get everybody involved. And so, there's an extent to which the world, there was a, there's a National Council of Churches in the United States that was called the Federal Council of Churches originally, and then the World Council of Churches, and a lot of people do picture them as being very liberal in their theology, influenced by, you know, um, 19th century and early 20th century German theologians and all of that, and to some extent that's true, but not universally true. And it started out as a real desire, especially to share the gospel with more people around the world. Okay? Now, we talked about the First Vatican Council and people in fallibility. Let's talk about John the 23rd and the Second Vatican Council. John the 23rd is one of my favorites. <clears throat> okay. In fact, both he and John Paul II are still considered candidates for uh, sainthood. The interesting thing is, in October of 1958, the Cardinals got together to elect a new pope, and they couldn't quite decide who they wanted. So they elected Cardinal Roncalli, Italian pope, um, and he became John the 23rd. Now, he was 77 years old. Everybody thought, he's not offensive to anybody. He's not going to do anything. But got somebody to sit in a chair for a year or two until we can elect somebody else. He took the name John the 23rd, which is interesting because there had been another John the 23rd. One of the anti-popes of the Great Schism had been John the 23rd. Well, they should have known at that point that this guy was not quite as, you know, Easy going as we think. Um, but he took the name John the 23rd, and um, three months later he declared his intention to call an ecumenical council of the church. He said he felt it was time for the Catholic Church to receive a major updating. He actually, I can't, I can't remember the, he's not an Italian word for it, um, to update the church. And when somebody says, what do you mean by update, he walked over and he opened the windows and he said, let the fresh air in. Now, he was strongly opposed by the curia, that is, the Vatican structure, because they really felt what they had to do was, you know, entrench, nail things down tighter, get more control, not, you know, and he's talking about letting fresh air in. We want to make sure we're buttoned up as tight as we can be. And so he had a lot of opposition, but he wouldn't take no for an answer, and he was the Pope. <laughs> and so he called the Second Vatican Council. It convened on October 11th of 1962. And there were several things about it that were quite interesting. One, it was the first time in major, in, that any major Catholic event had the majority of their delegates from outside 
Europe, Canada, and the U.S. 54% of, of the delegates to the Second Vatican Council were from the Far East, Africa, Latin America. Probably, you know, the Pacific nations as well. Right? No. But the idea was the power block, especially of Western Europe, didn't have power anymore. All these people came together, and one of the things that had happened, because the Curia didn't like the idea of doing this anyway, the, the councils of the Vatican had prepared all of these papers on, on various issues. They fully expected that they would pre present these papers to the various committees that the delegates had been formed into once they got there. They would present these papers to these committees, and the committees would say, okay, if that's what you want, boss. Well, they started presenting these papers to these delegates who were from Africa and Asia and Latin America, and they looked at it and went, no, we're not going to do that. And the Curia, the Pope had called these people together. They were all bishops or theologians or representatives of the church. And the Pope was not going to back the Curia in telling them what to do because he wanted to let the fresh air in. So they began to deal with these issues because the majority of the assembly made it clear that they agreed with Pope John XXIII, it's time for some change. Well, John XXIII died in June of 63 before the um, end of the council. Paul VI became the pope and he was uh, very conservative, uh, undoubtedly more conservative than John XXIII had been in terms of being strict for traditional Catholic doctrine. And yet, to everybody's surprise, John XXIII did not, they thought, the, 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 the really conservative ones thought that Paul was going to just shut it down. Okay, we're done, go home. He didn't do that. In fact, in his opening message, when he took over, before the gathering of the, the they brought that several sessions during this period of time, before the next session after John XXIII died, he had an opening speech in which he declared he was very much in support of what John XXIII had stood for. In fact, he used the quote, which I have here, that the goal, their goal was to build a bridge between the church and the modern world. And everybody's shocked that this very conservative new pope was agreeing with this. Well, the results were a number of major revisions to church polity, much more progressive, much more open. For instance, they officially said that churches don't have to use the Latin rite anymore. That you can have variations on, on that. You can do it in the vernacular language. That we wanted to encourage the provision of Bibles in, in something other than the Latin Vulgate. Um, I mean, this was pretty radical stuff. They even said, contrary to like Pius the Pius the, the Ninth, one of the things he had said is anybody who's not a Catholic is not a Christian. Period. Well, the Second Vatican Council announced that Protestant believers in Jesus Christ were separated brethren. Whatever that means. But it certainly is not you're going to hell. There was an openness to fellowship. Some of this relating to more ecumenical kind of feeling. But it was a radical difference. This is the first major change since the Council of Trent 400 years earlier. The Council of Trent, which was the major council of, of the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Counter-Reformation, established all of these very strict, very rigid anti-Protestant doctrines as being the doctrine of the church, and those became the dogmatic stance of the Catholic Church until the Second Vatican Council in the 60s. Okay. Um, it was huge. What was the First Vatican Council? That's the one that Pius IX called that declared him infallible. Okay, that was the First Vatican Council. Questions about that? Okay, I got five more minutes to deal with the whole rest of history. <laughs> and I'm going to do it quickly. Um, in fact, this didn't come up one at a time, so we'll look at it all at once. Let's switch to Protestantism in Europe. European Protestantism, Protestant theology, when it was confronted by rationalism and this new rational way of thinking, um, there developed a liberal Protestantism. Theology took a very liberal bent and the new liberal Protestantism proved to be very ill-equipped to deal with the realities and events of the 20th century. 20th century in Europe? Not a happy time. A great many challenges, like two world wars, among other things. So, um, 
the increase in skepticism and secularism ended up, it seems like, affecting mostly, uh, more seriously affecting, the very places that had historically been the strongholds of conservative Protestantism, of, you know, of Orthodox Protestantism, like Germany. Luther came from there. Like Scandinavia, where Lutheranism had been established and it was very strong. Like Great Britain, you know, the Church of England, and that they were so serious about, about their faith and about establishing Protestantism there. And yet those things came to be some of the places that were hardest hit by this liberal Protestantism. In fact, today, when they talk about Germany and they talk about Great Britain and they talk about Scandinavia, those are some of the areas that they most discuss as being post-Christian. I mean, Christianity is no longer a major influence culturally. Now there are places that it's beginning to make little revivals. Okay, in England, for instance, there is a an evangelical Anglican movement that is beginning to have, again gain some traction. But those became the areas where once they had been the strongest in terms of most committed to having an Orthodox Protestant faith, they became the post have now become the post Christian areas where Christianity is not considered a factor at all. Um, now and then with the rise of Hitler. Many of these liberal European Protestants, and in fact many Catholics, who feared communism more than they did fascism. And you know that Nazi, Nazism is a fascist idea, as was Mussolini. Okay? Um, uh, fascism is, is, you know, take communism and reach down his throat and pull it out and you got fascism. It's the opposite in terms of communism saying, Everybody's supposed to be equal, and we all share, and nobody's supposed to have power. Fascism says the nation is more important, and the people who represent the nation are more important, and so you, you clearly have a, you know, a hierarchy, a whole oligarchy, in order to maintain the idea of nationalism as being ultimate. Okay, so the fascist movements, which included Nazism and Mussolini's movement in Italy, etc., some people feared communism so much. Communism was one of the major enemies of fascism. You know, Hitler, before he even started talking about the Jews and, and others as much as he did, he targeted communists. Riots in Germany as Hitler was coming to power usually were riots between German nationalists who were fascists and communists because communist socialism was beginning, you know, Marx, who wrote the Communist Manifesto, you know where he was from? Germany. Okay, so there was a huge conflict there. So the people who were most afraid of communism thought fascism might deal with that problem for them, not knowing what fascism was going to turn into. Um, it actually led early on in Hitler's days and the rise of, of uh, National Socialism, which is Nazism, to the German Christian movement, which was a combination. And most Protestants were on board with this in, in Europe. Uh, not just in Germany, but in much of Europe, because uh, Germans especially, was a combination of liberal Christianity, as it developed in, uh, in the middle of the century in Germany and Europe, combined with notions of racial superiority in German nationalism. And that was the German Christian movement. Well, a lot of, as I say, most Protestants joined this. The Catholic Church actually supported, it, it, not, not in, in overt ways, but but initially supported the ideas that Hitler espoused because they thought it was gonna, that they were going to fight communism and that was a good idea. And remember, the Catholic Church was against republics, against democracy. And here was a very strong leader, the Führer, who was going to establish a monarchical kind of control and it sounded at first like he was going to represent the things the church wanted. And so early on, the popes actually were in favor of Hitler. Not overtly, not like they were sending him money or anything, but they, they weren't against him. Later on, when they began to see what was, some of the things were happening, the popes did take uh, covert actions, for instance, to try to protect the Jews. There's always been accusations against Pius XII, who was the pope during Hitler's, uh, the actual Third Reich re regime, that he was too weak in responding to the atrocities that were being committed against the Jews. Historians now seem to indicate that he actually was working behind the scenes, but he felt like the worst thing he could do would be overting his confrontation, and you know, because the, the Nazis, Nazis had the power to shut him and everybody else down. So better to not be as overt in your opposition, but instead behind the scenes to try to do something. Okay, so I don't think he's nearly as bad guy as some people have painted him since then.
But at the same time, some pastors and theologians, Protestant pastors and theologians, got together in Europe and they formed what became known as the Confessing Church. That included Karl Barth. Karl Barth is the most important 20th century theologian total. Okay. Um, uh, he doesn't have a PhD, he's a pastor. But his commentary on Romans is probably the most significant book from a Christian perspective written in the 20th century. Um, he started teaching Romans. And he taught Romans for 30 years. Okay. Pretty in depth. Karl Barth, interestingly enough, Rudolf Ultmann, who became sort of the poster child for radical, liberal, non believing Christianity later, he was a New Testament scholar. He's the one that came up with a demythologizing whole thing. I won't get into detail, but we don't like him so much, except that he represented. <laughs> He was one of the ones who had the bravery to get together to form the Confessing Church, along with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Niemöller, and others. Some of them, like Martin Niemöller, was imprisoned early after they gathered uh, as the Confessing Church, and he was imprisoned until after Hitler. Okay, so he spent nine years, I think it was, in prison. Um, and not a good prison. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer eventually was arrested, sent to prison, and then to a concentration camp, and pretty much out of spite, with just a few days before the concentration camp where he was being held, was was liberated by the Allies, they hanged him. Uh, they were going through trying to make sure they killed everybody who had been their worst enemies, and they considered Dietrich Bonhoeffer one of those, even though he was greatly beloved by not only the other inmates in the concentration camp, but the guards. The guards would sneak his letters out because he demonstrated to them what a person ought to be as a Christian. Um, so, and the great document, the foundational document of the Confessing Church is the Barman Confession. The Barman Confession is one of the confessions that is in the Presbyterian Book of Confessions. And it is a statement, a declaration that, you know, against the authoritarian political environment they faced, and that a Christian has an obligation to stand up against that kind of thing in favor of the truth of Jesus Christ, even if he should be a price, which most of these guys did. And lastly, in 30 seconds, I'm going to give you the whole rest of history. The First World War, um, again, there's this, all this optimism, this great, you know, we can do anything. The First World War came along and devastated all of Europe. I mean, when I say devastated, I'm not going to quote statistics, but there wasn't a town, probably not a home in Europe that was not affected by the First World War in terms of the loss of life and things. Millions of people killed. It's not just military, uh, but civilian as well. The U.S. got involved in it, and even though the U.S. only came in late in the game, and our they weren't fighting battles on our territory, and so we didn't feel it the same way that they did in Germany and France and Belgium and places like that, still there was a sense in which, how can we be so optimistic when this is happening? A whole generation killed of British and French and German, okay, and Belgian and, you know, Luxembourgian, etc. Um, and that had a major effect in terms of the churches all of a sudden backing up and saying, how do we deal with this kind of suffering? How do we do deal with atrocity? We then had, interestingly enough, the effect of prohibition in the United States. Uh, prohibition was a weird thing. There's a great documentary, by the way, by Ken Burns. You know Ken Burns, who did the Civil War? He's got one called The Prohibition. And he goes through all of that. One of the things prohibition did is you had this very strong liberal Christian movement in the US, and you had this very strong conservative Christian movement. Prohibition was the only thing they agreed on. The conservative Christians thought prohibition was a good idea because drunkenness was against the Bible. Liberals saw all the damage that was being done to people's lives by drunkenness, and so as an aspect of the social gospel, the liberals supported this. So the liberals and the conservatives both got behind this thing, and it ended up being one of the worst things that ever happened in the United States. I mean, seriously damaging the, the growth of organized crime, the fact that, that Massive numbers of otherwise law-abiding citizens felt perfectly fine with breaking a law that they didn't like. And that, that affected the psyche of a whole culture. Um, a lot of other very interesting things about that. But the weird part about it is it brought Christians together in, you know, in opposition to something that, that they were successful at. And for 10 years, they tore the country apart after they got what they wanted. Then the effect of the anti-evolution arguments which, again, that's the liberal teaching of evolution in the schools, the conservative teaching creation in the schools, the, the, the high point or low point, depending on how you look at it, uh, being the Stokes trial, where Charles Darwin, 
um, represented, you know, the conservative side, and in this this whole conflict, in which the problem with that was that the much of the country came out of that saying, "Are we back to the place where we're tearing each other apart again?" And many people who were on the fence saying, "Why you Christians are stupid? You know, what's wrong with you? You got to you got to pick your battles." And so that was one. Then we have the Great Depression in the United States. The Great Depression in the United States had much the, the, the same level of effect that the Great War, the First World War, had in Europe. Where this, all this optimism, all this expectation is it's getting better and better. I'm making more money every day even though I'm not doing a thing. You know? And th that everything's going to be great when you realize that we reached the place where one out of four people in the United States who were working, uh, who wanted to work, couldn't. That soup kitchens and uh, bread lines, uh, every city of any size, and most small towns had soup kitchens and bread lines. The idea that it's not getting better at that. You know, there's a reason why we maybe ought to be scared. It also forced, the church had been one of the major forces that prevented the United States from having unemployment insurance and uh, social security and benefits and welfare for the poor because they said that's communism. And the church has been, was a major opponent to all that. Those things existed in Europe, but, but many conservative Americans, and especially church people, did not support those things because they thought that's communism. It wasn't until we got a very strong leader in uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that, and the desperation that we got to, that they said we got to do something, so people don't starve to death in mass, that they were able to institute programs like that. And still, you know, the idea was that the New Deal to many people was, was, was communism, you know, a bad idea. My mother always said to us, she and her whole family, I come from a very poor background, you know, neither, my, neither of my grandparents had running water in the house, okay, um, that had it not been for Franklin Roosevelt, my, my mother said she and all of her siblings would have started it. There's no question. And yet the church had been one of the ones that fought against the programs to help the poor up to that point. Well, the whole world got a reality, you know, the whole country got a reality check at that point. Then World War II comes along. And it's a fact, it was similar to, um, to the First World War. And in fact, one of the major reasons the Second World War happened is because of the vindictiveness of the winners at the end of the First World War. Something that Woodrow Wilson fought against, by the way. He wanted to have a fair and equitable kind of treatment of the, of the Germans after the war, and nobody would listen to it. Um, the one thing about the Second World War is it kind of cut the tops off all of the peaks, and it kind of leveled everything. And so especially Americans coming back from the war because of the GI Bill, because of the economy having been stabilized. Roosevelt helped, but the thing that really got the United States out of the Depression was the Second World War. You know, the, the demand for us to increase productivity to support a war effort that people really were, I mean, especially after Pearl Harbor, everybody was in favor of, um, really kind of created an opportunity, and there was kind of a renewal of optimism at that point, which continued until, depending on where you draw the line, until the, the threat of nuclear annihilation, you know, duck and cover kind of stuff being taught in the schools, to, um, or to the media. And then the post-Christian movement toward a new center. The center of Christianity today, we still think it's either the United States or Western Europe, it's not. The center of Christianity today may be China. There's an indication that there may be more secret Christians in China than the whole rest of the world. Um, it, it's, you know, in terms of Catholic Christianity, it's Latin America. In terms of um, Protestant Christianity, primarily, it's Africa. I mean, the Church of Nigeria is one of the most powerful churches in the world today. Um, Episcopalians, the Episcopal churches in the United States that are leaving the Episcopal church because of the ordination of practicing homosexuals and things like that, um, a lot of them have joined the Nigerian uh, diocese because the Bishop of Nigeria is a very powerful, you know, committed, conservative, Anglican Christian who is a strong voice worldwide. So the, the center of the Christian world, you know, there's no longer a Christendom, which used to be Europe, all of the Christian nations of Europe formed Christendom, which was sort of the geopolitical Christian entity. It doesn't exist anymore. The center of Christianity, sort of the, the, the pivot point, has pretty much moved away even from North America. It left Europe, came to North America. It's pretty much moved away from North America now. And it's either in a hidden way China, or it's probably Africa. 
fact, I know of very sound theologians uh, and godly people who say they believe the reason that Africa has suffered so much in post-colonial, with famine and war and oppression, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is because the devil saw what was happening there and did not like it. And so has tried to break that whole continent. Okay, any questions about that? I didn't do justice to the last hundred years. I'm sorry. Hmm. Let us take a break for five minutes and then we will come back and take a test.